Uh, uh, welcome back. Uh, I hope all of you are doing well and all of you are in good health. So in today's class, what we will introduce ourselves with is a new software lifecycle model that is very efficient that is called as rapid application development. Now rapid application development is a linear sequential model that emphasizes on extremely short uh, software development cycle. So rapid application development is a very high speed adaptation of a linear model uh, where uh, the development uh, not only relies on where the software lifecycle model not only relies on uh, development but also it relies heavily on reusability. So if the requirements are well understood and the constraints are well defined, then rapid application development would be the best model to select for developing an application. Now, rapid application development has following phases. Uh, the first phase in rapid application development uh, model is business modeling phase. Now, it's very important for us to identify uh, the various entities that are participating in realizing the business. So that is the objective of business modeling phase. So the objective of business modeling phase is to facilitate one in identifying all the, the entities that are participating. Rather, entities are, or it, it can also be called as objects. So if you answer the following questions, it may be very easy for you to derive a uh, derive a or have a rough idea about a set of objects that are participating in realizing the business. So now the first one is, uh, what information drives the business process? So it's very important to answer this particular question. So an example, in case of library management system. Now library management system is a system that is driven by books, user, librarian, and so on and so forth. So what information drives the business, right? Now what information is generated? Who generates the information? Where does the information go? And who processes it? Just see, if you seek answer for these five important questions, what you will be able to do is you will be able to identify uh, the various objects, uh, the various potential objects that may be participating in realizing the business. So business modeling has a very important role to play. Now, once the business modeling phase is over, once the, the peers of communication has been uh, uh, achieved in business modeling phase, then what we do is we uh, initiate data modeling phase. Now, in case of data modeling phase, what we do is the information flow that has been identified during business modeling phase is transformed into a set of identifiable objects, as I've already said, because the peers of the communication and the one who runs the business will also always be uh, the objects, objects or the entities. So in case of the data modeling phase, that is the objective. The objective is to identify Identify all the objects that are participating in realizing the business. Now, once the objects have been identified, it's very important for one to identify the attributes uh, and the behaviors that are related with the objects. So once the attributes and the behaviors that are related with the objects are identified, and it and then it's very essential to establish relationship between objects because in order to realize certain business, what we need is we need participation of the objects and relationship between them. Uh, say for an example, uh, uh, one of the object in library management system is students. So students are attributed with various features, right? And uh, uh, and it has uh, several behaviors in it, it as well. Another object is, say for an example, a book. Uh, so book has a set of attributes and uh, consider a set of behaviors. Now just see, uh, relationship basically implies. Uh, say for an example, if I re establish a relationship that a, a user is allowed to borrow. Uh, zero or n, zero to n number of books. So what I've done is I've established a relationship between these two objects. So that helps us in realizing certain business. Now that is the object of data modeling phase. Now what we have is we have the next phase that is called as process modeling phase. Now once the, the objects have been identified, once the attribute has been listed, an idea about the methods that are there has been drawn. Now what we need to do is we need to implement all these methods. So in case of process modeling phase, the, the data objects defined in the data modeling phase are transformed to achieve information flow necessary to implement business functions. So what we need to do is we need to implement methods. Say for an example, methods like addition, modification, deletion, or retrieval of data, and so on and so forth. So that is what is process modeling phase uh, responsible for. Then comes application generation. Now, in case of application generation, in order to save time in case of rapid application development, rapid application development heavily relies on the use of fourth generation languages instead of third generation languages like C, C++, and so on and so forth. So it relies on framework like VVVV.net and so on and so forth. So uh, instead of using conventional third generation language, 
it uh, tries to use um, fourth generation language because it helps in saving time because the overall objective of rapid application development is to save time of uh, save time that is uh, required for developing a software product now once the application has been generated then what we need to do is we need to test uh, the system so the next phase is testing and turnover now here uh, the total amount of testing time in case of rapid application development is considerably reduced because what we are heavily relying on is we are heavily relying on a reusability of components that has been already tested and uh, tested and uh, and, uh, and uh, put to use so in case of rapid application development the total amount of testing time is considerably minimized Now this is a very a simple diagrammatic representation of rapid application development model. So rapid application development model has a development time of uh, two to six months. So it aims at achieving uh, the uh, achieving or developing the software system within two to six months. Where what we have is we have various phases, uh, various phases, and uh, across various phases, what we have is we have various versions being released. Now let us start from here. It's very easy. So la rapid application development, the overall development cycle is of two to six months. And the, the, uh, the development cycle is divided into two sessions. One is called as JAD, and the other one is called as focus group session. So JAD stands for joint application development, whereas FGA stands for focus group session. So in case of joint application development, there is a collaborative effort of both the developer as well as the customer in order to uh, create a concrete definition of the system. Now initially, just see, there might be diversion. Initially, there might be a diversion between developer's conception and the customer's conception. That means there might be uh, diver friction in, uh, or, or a divergence in the understanding of about the various functionalities between the customer and the developer. So during joint application development session, what we need to do is we need to weed out or eradicate certain, certain diversions and come up with a very concrete definition about the system in terms of scope, concept, and requirement. So what is the scope of the system? What are the various concepts that are participating? And what are the requirements? So now, uh, once the scope, concept, and requirement has been properly drawn, after a joint agreement or collaborative effort of both the customer and the developer, then the initial version of the software system is uh, uh, built, that is the version 1. Now, once the version 1 has been released, now the participation of customer ter uh, terminates. So the customer will be no further participating in software development because in the joint application development session only, uh, the customer has uh, participated and given their feedback about uh, what would be the scope, what would be the concept, and what would be the set of requirement. So then comes in the, the role of the focus group session. Now in case of focus group, focus group session, only the members in the development team participates. Uh, now the customer participation is over. And then what they try to do is you try, they try to identify any changes that are to be incorporated into the features, functions, and specifications that exist, uh, uh, exist in the system that has been, um, uh, that has been uh, drawn in the, the first version. So then after changing, uh, bringing about a change in the features, functions, and specification, you release the second version. And over a period of time, what you try to do is you try to completely refine the system into a final product. So version N will be the final product that will be uh, that will be uh, the, that will be created uh, in the focus group session. So focus group session basically tries to aim at creating uh, creating a, a final system or a complete system, taking into account uh, the uh, the initial version that was uh, built in collaboration with the customer. Now here, for releasing each and every version, there is a specific cycle time given. That is 1 to 21 days. So the successive version has to be released between 1 to 21 days, where in that 1 to 21 days, what we try to do is we try to re-specify, redesign, and uh, re-evaluate. So this is a continuous process, as in case of prototyping model. So what we try to do is we try to re-specify, we try to redesign, we try to re-evaluate. So based on the evaluation, a result of the evaluation, continuous refinement is done, and so and so forth. So this is a very simple representation of rapid application development uh, using iterative prototyping model. Now, uh, what may uh, so there might be a question that what are the advantages? Now, as we have already tested, 
in case of um, uh, rapid application development, uh, there is a joint application development session and a focus group session. In case of joint application development uh, session, there is a complete participation of the customer in order to resolve any uh, any issues that are there, uh, or contradicting issues that are there between the customer and the developer. So customer participation is very much important. Now. As the customer participates in the software development life cycle, customer may also be uh, satisfied, uh, satisfied with the product because their involvement, uh, their involvement uh, has been taken into consideration. Now, the second important advantage is that feedback from the customer is uh, taken into account in the initial stages uh, when the actual conception is done because, uh, because it is very much important when the requirement, the scope, uh, the concept and the requirements are identified. It's very important for the customer to participate. So since customer participates, uh, the, the probability of success is very high. Now the development time of uh, the, uh, the overall uh, the software system is considerably reduced. Considerably reduced, uh, not uh, reduced. Uh, one of the reason is that it heavily relies on reusability. And the second reason is that uh, uh, it uses latest developmental techniques. And the third important uh, reason is that rapid application development heavily relies on skill skill labor. So these are the three important components. Uh, these are the three important aspects that rapid application development emphasizes on because of which the overall software development life cycle is uh, so the time required for software development life cycle is reduced. I'll again repeat it. Uh, software uh, rapid application development heavily relies on uh, reusability, uh, that is reuse of the existing component in the new system. Uh, it heavily relies on use of latest developmental techniques of fourth generation uh, uh, de developmental paradigm and it heavily relies on uh, 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 skilled labor. So these are the important aspects that uh, um, rapid application development emphasizes on. So uh, uh, in case of rapid application development, in order to increase productivity, case tool and frameworks are used. This we have already discussed. And uh, involvement of user uh, early in the lifecycle model also will increase the acceptability of the product, definitely. So if there is a customer's involvement, then there is uh, increased customer satisfaction, which will increase the, the chances of, um, uh, chances of um, uh, acceptability of, uh, of a particular product. And uh, so these are the list of advantages. You can go through it in sequence. So uh, the, the other advantage, as I've already said, that uh, rapid application development relies on use of very skilled labor. So it also uh, aids in reducing the amount of uh, developmental time. So you can go through the various advantages. Now disadvantages. Rapid application development has, uh, uh, as it has a set of wide set of advantages, it also has disadvantages. Some of them I'll highlight it. So uh, rapid application development relies on highly specialized and skilled developers. So this is very much true because we have said in order to reduce the total amount of uh, time for development, uh, it, it relies on uh, skilled labor. So in absence of skilled labor, rapid application development fails tremendously. Now, uh, rapid application development also fails in situation where uh, the the modularization or the decomposition of the problem is not, not done properly. Because if the decomposition of the problem is done properly, then what we can do is we can eff effectively identify the various reusable modules, and only those that are to be implemented can uh, uh, will be implemented. But if there is an improper modularization of the problem in hand or improper decomposition of the complexity of the problem that is in hand, then uh, rapid application development fails. Now rapid application development also fails if the reusable components are not available because as I've said rapid application development heavily relies on reusability of existing components. So if uh, reusable components are not present and if you have to develop everything from scratch then definitely rapid application development fails. And uh, uh, the other reason why rapid application development uh, may fail is that if uh, customer participation is not there, so if the customer cannot uh, get involved into the uh, joint application development session, then uh, software application development, uh, rapid application development may fail. 
uh, to, uh, to deliver the result. So these are the few important uh, uh, notable disadvantages that are there of rapid application development that has to be looked onto. So if you have skilled labor, if you have reusable components, if you have uh, uh, if you have uh, skilled labor, if you have reusable components. Uh, and uh, and and uh, if you have four knowledge about four generation technologies, then rapid application development proves to be very effective. Okay, so these are the, the pros and cons of a rapid application development model. Now let us uh, uh, see uh, the uh, the the point of application. So when can we use rapid application? So uh, we can use uh, rapid application development in situation where. A system can be uh, properly modularized, so it's very much important. If the system can be decomposed in a set of identifiable functionalities and uh, there exist reusable components or reusable functionalities for that, then rapid application development can be used, can be applied to. A rapid application development can be uh, used in situations where uh, you have a, a good sound knowledge about the various requirements of the, uh, the the system. So if you are well acquainted with the various requirements of the system, then rapid application development proves to be very efficient. Now, rapid application development can be used in situation when the the end users or the users can be uh, can uh, can be a part of the development lifecycle model. So until or unless the users' feedback uh, is uh, a, a, a cannot be drawn, then rapid application development cannot be used for developing software application. Now. Rapid application development can be used in situation when users participate, user uh, uh, heavily uh, participates uh, in or he is heavily involved in the automation process. Okay, right. Now the next uh, 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 situation where what we can do is we can apply rapid application development. Is a rapid application develop can, development can be used in situation when the development cycle. Uh, 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 so, so the time required for development cycle is considerably low. So for an example, uh, usually about 60 days. Rapid application development can be used in situation where the software system can be delivered in pieces. So here it's written on, the, uh, so it can be used in situation uh, where uh, the, the system can be uh, delivered in incremental approach. Uh, rapid application development can be used in situation where uh, yeah. A situation where uh, uh, the the uh, the uh, well, it can be used in situations situation where uh, there there is a, there is a requirement uh, of time or there is a strict schedule in which within which the software system has to be uh, has to be delivered. So these are the uh, various situation in which what we can do is we can use rapid application development as a as a basis for developing uh, de developing the software product. Okay. So this is a very important model. So what I want you to do is I want you to uh, just um, uh, look into all important aspects of rapid application development. Now the next model that we have is component assembly model. Now component assembly model, as the name suggests, it is a model that uh, heavily relies on assembly of existing components. So uh, instead of starting uh, starting uh, afresh, uh, in case of component assembly model, the component uh, the system is built from the available component by putting together the component and making it. In interact with each other. So component assembly model is an incremental development model. It works like a prototyping model, but the only difference is that here uh, only component assembly is dot done and not uh, uh, and not development. Now in this case, component assembly model also has a very close resemblance with rapid application development model, uh, where both relies on reusability, but component assembly model only relies on uh, reusability, whereas uh, rapid application development uh, relies on reusability as well as development. Now component assembly model, uh, so you can go through the description of the component assembly model. Now component assembly model suffers from various stumbling blocks. So I have listed four stumbling blocks here. Uh, so component assembly model as it heavily relies on reuse of the existing components only, uh, component assembly model suffers from various uh, stumbling blocks. So these are nothing but problems. So programs previously created are non-optimal for component assembly model. Definitely. So programs that are previously created or modules that are previously created, it may so happen that the modules may be capable of delivering the expected result, but it may not be capable of incorporating itself or collaborating with the functionalities that, that then the existing system. 
So uh, this is very much important. So here, uh, what we need to always remember is that whenever we are using component assembly model as a basis for um, developing a system or building a system rather, uh, we need to always uh, look into a uh, collection of uh, a set of optimal set of uh, optimal set of components that can be used in the new system. Now, the second stumbling block is that evaluation of components is always done independent of the whole. Now, it may so happen that uh, a module may be capable of uh, delivering the expected result uh, uh, well within time and with the desired accuracy, but it may so happen that uh, the, the, the component may not be able to deliver results in collaboration with all the other new components that are there in the new system. So, uh, like in the, the stumbling block one, a, a, the, uh, in case of stumbling block two, uh, uh, component, the, the assessment of the components that are there belonging to the system should be done in collaboration with all the other, all the other components that are, there in the, 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 that are there in the system. So, evaluation of components in the, uh, is always independent to the, the whole program. So, uh, the component should be capable of collaborating with all the other components that are there in the new system. Now. The third stumbling block is a uh, uh, closely ended component. Now, closely ended component refers to a situation where uh, the component that can be possibly re reused is heavily coupled with the other components that are there in the, uh, the previous system. So, if you want to use a component, uh, so let's consider you want to use a component A uh, from a system, uh, from a library management system to a new system uh, that is, uh, say, for an example, uh, a book management system. So you want to reuse component A from library management system to a uh, book management system, but it may so happen that um, A may be uh, uh, tightly coupled with other set of components that are there in library management system and uh, potentially cannot be reused in uh, book management system because of its increased dependency to the other components. So it may so happen that uh, a, a component can be a, a maybe a closely edited component. Now this situation is also referred to as or such kind of components are also referred to as monolithic components. So monolithic components are components that are um, uh, uh, that are that, uh, that are capable of performing action but with a great degree of dependency. Right. So a third stumbling block that we have is closely edited component. Now the fourth uh, important problem that uh, may there may be there is licensing issues. Now licenses are, are not released with the components. Licenses are released with the product. So it may so happen that uh, re reusing a component from some other system that you have built for some other user into the new system may call for legal implications. So this, this is the fourth important aspect that you need to look into. So component assembly model is a model that completely relies on reuse of the existing component to create a new system, but it suffers from uh, several stumbling blocks. So the first stumbling block, again, I'll repeat it. Program previously created may, uh, may be not optimal for component assembly model because uh, it may not fit into the new system or it may not utilize the resources optimally or may not be capable of collaborating with the, uh, the new set of components that are there in the new system. Now, stumbling block two, evaluation of components is always done independent of the whole. That means that implies that a component may be capable of uh, if efficiently generating the expected result and well within time. But it may so happen that it, uh, it may not be capable of integrating with the other modules that are there in the, the system or may be capable of badly in, uh, collaborating with the, uh, the other models that are there in the new system. Now, the third is something block that you have is called as closely ended component. So closely ended component uh, refers to a situation where there is a degree of, uh, there is a high degree of dependency between the module and a, um, other modules that are, uh, so that, that was supposed to be reused. So in such situation, uh, reusing a, a existing component or existing module becomes very difficult because of its increased dependency to other modules. And the fourth important issue is the licensing issue where uh, licenses are issued with the product, not with the components of the product. So it may call on for legal implication, uh, legal implication if you reuse the component of existing existing system into a new system, right? Now these are the various problem that makes a uh, component assembly model a rather uh, non-dependable module or, or is often not used. Now the next uh, life cycle model that uh, that we need to discuss is called as the evolutionary model. This is also one of the important life cycle model that you have. Evolutionary model, uh, the model is also known as successive version model because as the, the software system evolves, different version of the, the, the software system is being released. 
Uh, second example, you must have observed Facebook. So over a series of time, the Facebook system has evolved. So it follows evolutionary development model. So this model is also known as successive version model. In this model, first the system is broken down into several identifiable modules or functional units. And then the system is development in a in development in a development a developed in a or system development takes place in an incremental model. So it is very important. First, uh, what we need to do is we need to modularize the, the overall problem into a set of identifiable modules and then to develop it incrementally. But here, one of the crucial decision points that you need to um, that you, that that you need to uh, create is that uh, which of the modules will be released uh, early in the life cycle model and uh, which of the modules will be released later in the life cycle model because uh, depending upon what modules are released at what point in time the success of the product uh, is determined because if you if you if you if you re if you release the initial version with a very a set of very low priority modules then the the, the 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 success of the product may be considerably low Right? So it's very important for us to prioritize the module. So the development, the developer first develops the core modules in the system and then the core modules uh, uh, core modules are, are, are core module is released as the initial version, and then uh, cap capabilities are added. So the developer first develops the core module of the system. This initial product skeleton is refined into increasing the level of capabilities by adding new set of functionalities. So once the the initial version with the core module has been released, then what you need, to, what you can do is you can add up new capabilities into the system and uh, eventually come up with the uh, the, the final system. Now, the advantage of this particular model over other model is that here the, the software system is being released in successive versions. And successive versions, which implies that uh, you have multiple versions of the software system being released with uh, vari uh, um, the varied capabilities. So here, the requirement need not be completely defined. So one of the advantages, as I've stated here, is early delivery of the portion of the system uh, even though some of the requirements are not yet de decided upon. So uh, what we can do is we can start with the, uh, the, the development phase and the release phase, uh, development phase and release phase uh, when a set of requirements are not yet properly de uh, decided upon, the, the entire set of requirements is not decided upon. Now, uh, the core, uh, so what happens when you release the version in uh, system in different versions, the core modules get thoroughly tested. Thereby, uh, what happens is that it increases the, uh, the chances of uh, errors in the final product. Okay? So use of early release at, uh, uh, as tool for requirement elicitation. Now just see what happens that, what this particular point implies that, so when you release the initial versions, then you will come up with, uh, you'll come up with, uh, uh, with, uh, with a representation from the customer that what they want in the next version of the software system. So as a, as a version is released, as the assessment is done by the customer, customer comes up with the new set of requirements that uh, they expect the, ne the next version to have. So it may be, the, it may be used as a process for uh, getting uh, or seeking requirement from the customer as well. So these are the few notable advantages of uh, uh, evolutionary model. Now disadvantages. Now it may at situation it may be difficult to problem to divide the problem into a set of functional uh, functional units, right? And uh, and uh, and it, if so happens that uh, then then the evolutionary model fails to provide solution to the problem. Okay, I'll repeat it. If the if the uh, if the, the system cannot be functionally divided into module, then in certain in such kind of situation, um, uh, 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 evolutionary model fails to deliver the result. And uh, evolutionary model can only be used in situation where the problem size is considerably high, larger program um, uh, or large. It cannot. It it should not be used in situation where the problem size is considerably low because of the inherent complexities that are involved. So here, what we have learned about is we have learned about uh, what is evolutionary model, what are the qualities of evolutionary model, what are the advantages and disadvantages. Right. So now the next uh, life cycle model that we have uh, is spiral life cycle development model. So this model, what we are going to do is we are going to discuss in the next class. So uh, thank you very much and stay safe.